chapter 4 this morning. We're looking at verses 4 through 7. One quick story uh, about married life. Um, I think it was three, three years ago, three or four, we had a young lady living with us named Abigail, and she was from Texas, and uh, she was up here because her fiancé lived in this area, and they wanted to spend some time before they got married. Um, anyway, together in the same neighborhood, and so they got married sometime in that fall, but they had a reception at the Grizzly Rose a few, a month or two after their wedding, and so Paige and I went, and you know how it works when they, you know, all the married couples are to come out on the floor. You guys have all done that, right? <clears throat> and then they play a song, and then they start listing off, okay, those married less than six months, leave the floor and they take it up for another year or whatever and stuff like that. And I looked around the floor right when it got started. I said, Paige, we're winning this. It's not even going to be close. I mean, not even close. And, um, and it wasn't. So I think we, we had just celebrated our 26th. And I think the closest one was like 13 or something like that. And, and anyway, so, you know, she looks so much younger than me. So it makes me look like I'm young too, which is great. But, um, but um, anyway, I, I don't think they, the, the guy that was leading it couldn't really believe what was happening, that we had been married the longest. And so at 13, when the last guy got off, he's like, 15, 16? And he goes, 17, 18, 19, <laughs> starts listening it off, and I think it was 26. And as we're walking off the floor after our victory, this one guy goes, man, that woman is tenacious. And I thought, that is a good word for my dear wife. So yeah, so I, I've been blessed for 29 years and she's growing in long suffering. And that's how we look at it. So let's go ahead and read Philippians chapter four, um, verses four through seven. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your, reasonable, your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So again, um, I think most of you know I was camping this week, and so we're taking a one, one week break from um, the Sermon on the Mount. I went up in the mountains by myself because my family was in Italy, but they're back. And so anyway, had a great time, beautiful up there. We bought a new little, we bought a used camper and tested that all out. It was really nice. And, so anyway, if you can make it up to Steamboat, to Stagecoach State Park, if you've not been there, it's really beautiful. But anyway, with that said, um, I didn't have enough time this week to, to do the Sermon on the Mount. But uh, if you'll recall from a year ago in May, uh, when we introduced, or when I introduced the Sermon on the Mount, I, I titled it the Mother of All Sermons, right? That, that every, <laughs> Deborah Barros, look at you. Oh my goodness. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you, lady. Um, anyway, so I, I titled it The Mother of All Sermons. And one of the things that I said is that if you, if you look at the New Testament and you go through uh, almost any theme that you find in the Sermon on the Mount will be elaborated upon somewhere else in the epistles or something like that. And this passage in Philippians here is no exception. And when we start back into the Sermon on the Mount next week, you're going you're gonna, to, you'll see, what are we, we talk about that don't be anxious for anything, Jesus says. Just lay it all. And then he spends the next several verses talking about why numbered the hairs on your head. You're more important than the birds. I'm going to take care of you, food, all that type of stuff. And so this is one of those passages where Paul, um, again, I've had this interesting conversation with a friend through the years, and they say that, you know, us evangelicals pay too much attention to Paul. You know, we need to focus on other stuff, which I think is bunk. But anyway, but, but the whole, whole idea, and one of the responses that I've said to them, yes, Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit, 100%, right? There's just no doubt about that. But I also say, you know what, there's, there's a sense in which he's really not that original, Okay, he, he's elaborating on themes that we find throughout the scriptures. Uh, he's talking about things in the Old Testament a lot. And then he's also elaborating and explaining the teachings of Christ. And so again, 100% inspired Holy Spirit. But again, just what, how do we describe the Bible sometimes? That the Old Testament um, points to Christ, the Gospels reveal Christ, and the New Testament epistles explain Christ. And that, that's really the way it is. And, and so in this passage here, I, I think Paul, in the inspiration, may have had the passage in Matthew um, that we're going to be looking at here over the next several weeks in mind when he penned these words. And anyway, so what we're going to do is just spend some time here and, and look at this great little passage here. Uh, again, I would assume many of you have probably memorized uh, verse 6, do not be anxious for anything but by everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, uh, let your requests be made known to God. And then, of course, verse 7, 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you've not memorized that, I would deeply encourage you. Uh, those will be very weighty, helpful, um, wonderful verses uh, as you walk, through, walk with Christ through this life. It's interesting. It's hard to articulate everything that we have in Christ, isn't it? When you sit there, you think about who he is, what he's done, his character, uh, the promises that we have in him. Uh, our, our limited minds really can't get a hold of them that well. But here's, here's someone that, that wrote what we have in Christ. A love that can never be fathomed, a life that can never die, a righteousness that can never be tarnished, a peace that can never be understood, a rest that can never be disturbed, a joy that can never be diminished, a hope that can never be disappointed, a glory that can never be clouded, a light that can never be darkened, a happiness that can never be interrupted, a strength that can never be enfeebled, a purity that can never be defiled, a beauty that can never be marred, a wisdom that can never be baffled, resources that can never be exhausted. And I really think, I really think maybe one of the key themes or maybe the greatest task that we have as believers is just to figure out what we have in Christ and live in light of it. It's kind of simple, right? Who is Jesus? What he's done? What has he done? How do we live that out? Live out who he is. Now, the task is straightforward, right? Live in light of what he's done. Now, it's complex learning how to do all that, and we spend our whole lives doing it, and then in glory we'll be taken care of. But but anyway, when, when, when we think about Jesus himself, <clears throat> when we look at his life, everything that I just read really describes him, doesn't it? Really describes him. He was never ruffled, never anxious. He was supernaturally joyful, always gentle. Now, he, he became rather direct with false teachers and leaders, right? He, he had some fairly harsh words for people. And, and, and sometimes with God's wisdom, that's required. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've had someone... Who, who loves you um, and really gets in your face about something and says, you need to change your thinking. And when that happens, um, hopefully you look back on that time and say, thank you, Lord, for bringing that person into my life. And, and so Jesus does that with the Pharisees. He does that with religious leaders. He says to his disciples, he gets really frustrated with them at times. Uh, but again, the goal there is always bring them into greater understanding. And one of my favorite passages that I try to remember is, is a, a rebuke goes deeper into a wise man than a hundred blows into a fool. And I think that's really important for all of us to have that in our mind, uh, that even though uh, Christ has all these things for us, when we get rebuked, it's vitally important that we, that we take that well. Uh, but today here this morning, let's really focus on uh, what we have in Christ. Um, specifically, there's four things that you can see here. Um, uh, we'll talk about that here in just a second. But, but the big idea here this morning is due to God's presence and provision, we should be joyful, gentle, and peaceful people. And so four proofs this morning of the presence of Christ in your life. Here's some things that uh, at minimal ought to be in seed form. Um, if they're not sprouted too much. And, and, and I hope and pray that uh, if you've been walking with Christ for any length of time, that it's more than just seedlings, that there's some little growth and some things that are going on. Um, my home, or last March, a year ago in March, I, I decided to try to make some bon grow some bonsai trees from seeds. And so I got four different seeds, and one of them didn't take at all. But the other three did, and, and one's a, a Norway spruce, and it's about three inches tall right now, so it's been a little over a year. The other one's a Rocky Mountain bristle cone, which grows really slow, okay? But it's about two inches high right now. But then I have this other thing called a blue hawk aranda, which grows really, really fast. And it's great to watch these things. And, and so that's the way this should be a little bit. Hopefully, you're not like that first seed that just nothing happens with these things, but, but maybe in some of your cases, it's a, it's a real slow-growing aspect of what it means to be a Christian, maybe a little faster with that Norway spruce. Maybe it's just really blossoming like the, like the blue hawk aranda. And uh, I hope that's the way it is for me. I hope it is for you too. So let's look this morning at four proofs of the presence of Christ. Number one, joy. Number one, joy. Verse four, what? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and everything. Give thanks. Paul writes to the Thessalonians. But again, uh, if you've studied Philippians, uh, which I have a lot. I've taught through this, this book many, many times in my ministry life. Um, if you've 
taught through it or you understood it, you've studied it, joy is maybe the theme. You know, the Philippians is the book of joy. Verse 118, there's joy in the proclamation of the gospel. 125, there's joy of faith. 217 and 18, there's the joy of sacrificial service. 228, 29, 4, 1, and 10, it's the joy of Christian fellowship. And so it's the, the epistle of joy is a good way to say this. But not only in the Philippians, but in the whole of the New Testament, what? Joy is to mark your life as a believer. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy. Second one listed there. I, I, I do think love does have a, a priority in the list, but then, but then the rest of them are all kind of mixed together there because they all come out of love. Uh, but that love, joy, peace, patience, we'll come back to those here in a little while. According to Jesus himself, we are to be people who are living in light of his joy. John 15, 11. These things, Jesus says, I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is the joy that Paul is speaking about here. Uh, he's speaking about it here in 4.4 4, and then also 3.1. Rejoicing or joy in the Lord, the joy of Jesus, this is to be a part of our life if you are in Christ. Now, what do we, what do we know about this joy? It's bound up completely and totally in the knowledge of who he is and who God is. That's it. It's not about our circumstances, right? Because circumstances, good, bad, somewhere in between a lot of times. Uh, even uh, when things aren't going our way, what? There, there should still be this, this, this supernatural joy about us, not because of our circumstance, but because of the greatness of who God is. Now, why was Jesus joyful all the time? Why was he? Well, he had complete trust and he was totally obedient to God. That's right. Now, again, you're flawed and broken, so am I. So that, tr that complete trust and total obedience won't be ours until glory. But as we grow in trust, as we grow in obedience to God, then, then of course, that joy is going to increase. Now, some confusion comes in sometimes when we think about joy because we sit there and think about, you know, Walmart buying the Broncos. Woo! No one's happy about that besides me. The Wally, the Wally World Broncos, is that the way it's going to be? No. Anyway, but sometimes we think joy is just something that's, that's you know, it's, it's an emotion. We think it's something that kind of comes and goes. By the way, it's better than the Heinz ketchups. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, anyway. <laughs> sorry, football insider jokes, if you're not familiar. I, I know that this church doesn't appreciate the great game, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> but, but this joy, sometimes we think of it as, a, as, a, as an emotion, that it's something about how I feel, you know, some circumstance happens, you know, Natalie's going to have a baby and, and we're all going to be joyful, especially those two. And, and again, that's, that's true to some degree. There is that type of temporal joy that is real. Uh, but the joy here that we're talking about is, is different than that. John MacArthur says this, some wrongly identifying joy as a purely human emotion find Paul's twice repeated command to rejoice puzzling. How, they ask, can people be commanded to produce an emotion? But joy is not a feeling. It is the deep down confidence that God is in control of everything for the believer's good and his own glory. And then when all, and then all is well, no matter what the circumstances. Rejoice is a present imperative, calling believers to the continual habitual practice of rejoicing. Neither Paul's imprisonment nor the Philippians' trials should eclipse their joy. So the Christian's joy, again, it's not based on circumstance. Rather, it's based on the character and the nature of who God is and what he's told us and promised us and, of course, fully demonstrated in the person of Christ. So if you want your joy to increase, if you want this, this supernatural, this, this untouchable joy to, to increase in your life, there's, there's a very, again, simple way to go about enhancing it. And that's to get to know your God better. Just get to know your God better. Understand his character more and more. Here's Tozer. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the greatest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man 
is not, where, is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what, is his deep heart, but what his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christians, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. Just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. She can never escape the self-disclosure of her witness concerning God. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. Again, I left out the, the first quote from Tozier, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about you. And even if you're an atheist, unbeliever, not Christian, some other religion, that is you. It is the most important thing. So the question then is, is what comes into your mind when you think about God? Paul states here in the New Testament states with clarity that this ought to be leading to joy. As you deepen in the understanding of his attributes, these things deepen joy. What are some of those attributes? Well, he's sovereign. Uh, he's immutable. His steadfast love endures forever. Won't change. I, the Lord, do not change. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Again, another great memory voice verse. If you're, if, you're, if you're having a rough one, you're caught up in sin, which all of us find ourselves in at times, and you blow it, which you will, what? Go to bed, ask forgiveness, get up. Lord, your steadfast love never ceases. Your compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Yeah, get up and go because that's what this life is like. But that's who he is. Materially, Philippians 4.19, my God, what? Shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And again, we're going to deal with that in Matthew, right? So I again say that Paul is not really speaking originally. He's elaborating on truth that Jesus has declared. This love manifests itself in salvation. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, that's, that's, that's a demonstration. Uh, again, I'll say there's no one in this world today who cannot say that God doesn't love them because he's demonstrated it in Christ. He's proven it in Christ. The fact that our names are written in the book of life, Luke 10, 20. Now, this is one of, I think this is a, a pastor's, or it should be like a missionary or a pastor's favorite verse because he sends out the 72 and they go out and they're doing all this stuff. They're preaching the gospel. They're casting out demons and, and raising the dead and, and, and doing all kinds of stuff, healing the sick and the blind. And they come back and, and, and they say to Jesus, Jesus, even Lord, even the demons obey us. And Jesus rejoices with that. But then he turns around and says this, don't rejoice because of that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's a pretty good life foundation as well there, right? As you go about your life, it's not so much about success. It's not so much about failure. It's not so much about uh, what, what happens in your life or doesn't happen to the dreams that you have and, and they're crushed or destroyed and you're sad about this, that, and another thing, which is what life is like. But Jesus says, look, you know, life is this way. Sometimes you're going to have great success. Sometimes you're going to have a complete failure. But there's one thing to you, for you to rejoice in. Your names are written in the book of life. You are known by God. Rejoice in that. His working all things for his glory, Romans 8, 28. Again, the tragedies and trials of our lives. Now, again, this, this topic is vast, right? This topic can be, go on forever and ever and ever. For me, I think I've said to you before, Psalm 100 is a default text. It really is. And I encourage you, again, if you don't memorize it, at least go to it. It's short. It's only five verses. But we are to be people of praise and rejoicing. Why? Because God is God and God is good. That those are the bases of your praise and rejoicing. You're to enter his courts with thanksgiving, his gates with praise, however he phrases that, you know, or make loud singing and whatnot and live a joyful life because of two things. God is God and God is good. And that's it. Uh, everything else comes and goes, but God's character does not. It does not. 
So one of the proofs of the presence of God in your life is this, this joy, this rejoicing, this focus on the character, nature, work of God that, that oversees and overcomes all of our temporal circumstances. And in the worst of all possible things, I can still rest in his goodness and his godness. And I can be a person of this untouchable joy. Secondly, this morning, gentleness. Almost automatically, what? Joy and gentleness go together. Now, if you're using the ESV there, it says reasonableness. And this is one of those words that gets translated in a bunch of different ways. Um, I like gentleness. Reasonableness is fine. But I think for the, for the argument here this morning, gentleness is a better, a better word to use here. And it's automatic. If I have Christian joy... Again, if I'm resting completely in the character of God, his work, his nature, who he is, then gentleness will come right with, come right with it, vice versa. If I have gentleness, biblical God-honoring gentleness, joy will be a part of that. Joy will be there too. One doesn't lead to the other, but they come as part of the package. Again, consider Galatians 5.22 again. What does it say? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. And again, notice that fruit is singular, but all of these characteristics of fruit are, there's a bunch of them. So again, it isn't just, well, I have this fruit, you know, I'm kind, but you know, self-control, not one of them. No, I, I do. I have all of these. They should be a part of my life if I'm in Christ. And again, growing and maturing. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, what does it say about Jesus? It says Jesus is meek or gentle. This is who he is. And again, as we work through this, as we look at this, this life of Christ and, and we look at our life in Christ, gentleness will be a, a part of who we are because we are in Christ and it will be growing. So what is this gentleness? Well, it's having a mind to put others ahead of ourselves. That's simply what it is. Because if you think of someone who is not gentle, you think of someone who is unreasonable, what does that mean? It means they're saying, you need to listen to me. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you do. I'm important. You're not. That's what this ungentleness or lack of gentleness, this lack of reasonableness. It's, so to be gentle is to be someone who is putting the thoughts of others ahead of themselves. Now, look back in Philippians chapter 2 and just take a look here. And look at what it says here. Again, do nothing, chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Goodness, if we as people in all of our relationships kind of kept that at the forefront, you know, and specifically in marriages, in parent-child relationships, these types of things, if if we could just be someone who is saying to myself, in this relationship, this person is more important than me. This person is more significant than I am. And then the two of you or the three of you, whoever it is, you know, you're, you're bending over backwards to consider the other person more important. Now, sometimes that leads to conflict because what? I want to serve you. No, no, you serve me. You know, all this stuff. And you get in a fight over where to go for, go for lunch or something like that. But, but you get the point, right? If, if your goal, your goal is to be someone who is, who is striving to consider others more important than yourself, generally speaking, things are going to go well. They're going to go well. Now, it, it goes deeper than simple selflessness, though. Uh, look at 5 through 8 of that same passage. Have this mind among yourselves. And again, remember what I said at the very beginning here. The goal of the Christian life is just to figure out all that we have in Christ and live in light of it. That's it. So what does he say? Have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What mind? Who, although he was in the form of God, Christ, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross, on the cross. And so, so again, friends, what we're doing here is when we sit there and think about gentleness, we're, we're picturing Christ and, and the whole idea there, this whole concept of gentleness or reasonableness is this idea of putting others ahead of ourselves. Now, Christ demonstrates his gentleness to us uh, in a complete and total renunciation of his personal rights and privileges. And again, we could spend a lot of time in that Philippians chapter two passage. It's called the kenosis passage. Um, interestingly, 
one of the really encouraging things to me over the, since since I've been in seminary in the '90s. I don't know if you follow this at all, but <clears throat> the age of the skeptic's view of the age of the New Testament books is getting closer and closer to Jesus with almost every year. Okay, so when I'm in seminary, the primary argument from um, liberal scholars is that all of these New Testament books, the earliest one was written 200 years after the time of Christ. Of course, all of us as all of us as true Bible believers say, no, and written within the first 20, 30, 40 years. Well, it's been interesting in those 20 years, it is now almost universally recognized that all the books of the New Testament were floating around in the Mediterranean world within the first century. And it's not even argued anymore. And one of the main skeptics of the New Testament is Bart Ehrman. Uh, he and James White have had a couple of debates, if you're familiar with James um, and, and Bart. But Bart Ehrman has written a lot of different critical, textual critical books about the Bible. But I was reading in another book that even Bartman, Bartman, Ehrman, okay, Bart Ehrman, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> Bart Ehrman even recognizes that this, this statement here from verse 5 through 8 of Philippians 2 is not original to Paul. In fact, it was a sort of liturgical statement that was going around in the church very early on. And so even within, you know, 5, 10, 15 years after the death of Christ, uh, the church would gather together and they would, you know, like we do the Lord's Prayer or we sing the doxology or something like that. Uh, the church would gather together and say this to each other, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, and go through the whole thing. And it was this liturgical statement that was being, that was floating around in the church very early. And again, even Ehrman recognizes that includes that. So it's very early, again, very encouraging to see uh, the scholarship of the New Testament coming around to what, you know, if you've been a Bible believer for any length of time, you, you've known to be true as is, and that all of the books of the New Testament are very early and right around the time of Christ or within 20 to 30 years or a little bit longer than that. So Christ demonstrates to us that this gift of gentleness is a complete and total renunciation of personal rights and privileges. Okay, Matthew 5, 8, he's meek or he's gentle in the NASB. That's not weakness. It's rather, it's a passion about the glory and purposes of God at the expense of personal rights. It's a mindset of elevating and blessing others at the expense of personal wants and preferences. Now, <clears throat> it's vitally important that we are people that are passionate about doctrinal truth, right? But if your passion for doctrine and your understanding of biblical truth isn't leading to deeper worship and love for God and a deeper desire to serve others, then you need to go back and rethink your, um, not, not, not rethink the truth of what you're learning, but what it ought to be doing to you, what it ought to be doing to you. You want to be someone who's passionate about doctrinal truth, the gospel and all it entails, but self-sacrificing in everything else, even in the face of abuse, of course, we have multiple demonstrations of this. Joseph in Egypt is perhaps maybe the clearest one, speaking to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And of course, you can go back and read in Genesis that whole idea and think about the joy and the gentleness of Joseph in that whole thing, how he embraces his brothers with tears, loves on them, cares for them, even serves them. Here's Peter O'Brien speaking about gentleness. The context of ill treatment, torture, and even disgraceful death strongly suggests that gentleness here signifies a humble, patient steadfastness, which is able to submit to injustice, disgrace, maltreatment without hatred or malice, trusting in God in spite of it all. Boy, what a fruit of the spirit we need today, huh? You know, as our, as our society just becomes more tribal, becomes more, you know, it's all about me, uh, be who you are, you do you all that type of stuff, this attribute, as described here, gentleness. That's going to be the remedy. And then as we live out this gentleness in front of an incredibly hostile world, an increasingly hostile world, what? We get to point to Christ and say, he's why I can do this. He's why I can face malice, hatred, maltreatment, and still be joyful and gentle. Thus, based on this statement that we're looking at here, we should be bending over backwards in preference for one another in joyful service, even when that service isn't met with thankfulness. So that's the thing is I think sometimes, oh yeah, I'll serve as long as I get accolades, as long as I get a pat on the back. You know, and believe you me, I'm, I'm speaking from 
uh, personal. When I, when, I, when I pray, when I pray, Lord, do not lead me into temptation from the Lord's Prayer, one of those things is that I don't take pats on the back for a sermon. Well, how do I say this? If you compliment a sermon, I'm very thankful, okay? But I try not to let it go to my head because what? If I start doing that, then my sermons become terrible, right? They become bad. And so th- that's it. So, so that when, when, when this stuff happens like this, when, when you do something and you're trying to serve and glorify God and maybe it's not acknowledged or maybe even you're doing something for the glory of God and it's met with hostility, your good is evil spoken of, as they say. And I think what's the passage in First Peter, that, that they consider you evil as you pursue the goodness of God. You're considered evil. And, and so when that happens, what? You respond and you live out the gentleness here. Here's Moises Silva, another commentator on Philippians. Paul expects believers to be guided by a frame of mind that does not put priority on personal rights, Believers whose primary concern is whether or not they're being dealt with fairly will fail to exercise a fundamental element of the Christian behavior, preferring others above themselves. And again, what a need today. What a need today that if we're demanding justice for ourselves, if we're expecting to be treated fairly, now I want that to happen, right? But when it doesn't happen, how are you going to react? What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? How will you point to Christ in that whole thing? And I know those are tough questions. Each circumstance requires some different thinking. But again, the attitude here is what I need to be this way. My reasonableness, my gentleness needs to be seen by all. Everyone should know that, man, this person is reasonable. This person is gentle. So another proof of the presence of God in your life is gentleness. Thirdly, awareness of his presence. Yeah, one of my, again, I when I was in doing youth ministry back in Texas in the 90s, we memorized, the whole youth group memorized Philippians. And so I just want to tell you to memorize the whole thing. I'm going to say, you need to memorize this verse. No, just just, just memorize the whole book, okay? And, and be done with it, okay? And, and we go from there. Because you look at this, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. So um, both of these cases, joy, gentleness, and the, the peacefulness that we'll talk about here in a few minutes, the nearness of the Lord is the impacting and motivating factor. The Lord is at hand. Now, we're going to talk about two different aspects of what that means. First of all, he's here right now. Boom. Okay. I'm left-handed. So he's at my left hand, right hand. He's here. Go before me. Go behind me. Go above me. Below me. He's here. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. If you're a believer, amen. If you're an unbeliever, Time to wake up, okay? So, so he's here. The Lord is at hand, watching how I respond, watching those things that come out of my mouth. And, and again, if, if, you're, if you're caught up in this desire to follow Jesus, that's okay. It's okay because you want to be honoring to the Lord in what you think and how you act and what you do. When I was in high school, going into my senior year, of course, I played football, and, and, and um, a guy named Johnny Square played at um, Colorado State University back in the 70s, and he was drafted and played uh, for the Minnesota Vikings. Well, he was a pastor at the church that I, the Lord eventually saved me in a few couple months later, and he was also the friend of our football coach, and so coach had Johnny come out and introduced him and all this stuff, and he actually worked with us to coach us a little bit, and I was geeked out, right? I was like, oh, Kind of NFL players helping us today. And, and I mean, uh, I, it upped my game. I was excited. I want to do really well for this type of stuff. By the way, Johnny um, ended up being my college pastor, and he baptized me a couple of years later. So that's a sweet memory for me there. Uh, but it was a motivating factor. He was there. I was excited. I raised the level of my game because Johnny was near, right? Johnny was near. Well, if we can take that same mentality and put it out towards the Lord is at hand, the Lord is near, he's here. On the flip side, what? You have the opposite. If we're not living in light of his nearness, we tend to be a little, what? Not as, not as wise as we ought to be. I was a manager at a Chick-fil-A in Texas when we were there in seminary, and I was the morning manager. And the owner of that franchise, he had four daughters, and they would come in. 
and start working and they were completely unmanageable and really disrespectful. And so basically as the manager, I said, you take the front, I take the back, do not cross into this door and things will be fine. And that's really how it was. But when Steve came in, the owner, they just straightened right up. They just straightened right up. So, so again, there's, there's a flip side. There's a good side there. We want to raise our game because the Lord is here. We want to live out who Jesus is because the Lord is close by. But again, if we're not doing that, we might be people who are unmanageable. We might be not thinking about joyfulness. We might not be thinking about gentleness and peacefulness. So in this case, as I said, there's a bit of an encouragement, a bit of the warning Okay, uh, again, it has meaning to both spatially and temporal stuff. Uh, Lord is here, but there's also this idea that he's coming again, which we'll deal with here in just a moment. God's presence and his spirit lead us into joy and gentleness and peacefulness. The nearness of him, the fact that he is at hand ought to be something that is manifesting itself in joy, gentleness, and peacefulness. Now, if God's with me here, if he's with you, I don't have to worry about anything, right? Right? Because what? I have the sovereign, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-loving, perfect God of the universe who is with us at all times. And, and even, in those, even in those moments where you're like, oh, goodness, what is going on? I don't get this. Well, what do you do? You rehearse the truth of who God is in those times. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 32, I think. No, 32, 4. The rock, his way is perfect. All his ways are justice. All of them. See, the challenge for us is that recognizing that, leaning into God, that there's times, friends, when, when things don't go your way and really heartbreaking stuff is going on. And I, I know several of you have gone through that. So have I. Well, we've all gone through it. And the temptation, because we're fleshly people, is to raise our fist, Right? God, how could you do this? Or even if we don't articulate it that way, we demonstrate it by pulling back. We stop reading the scriptures. We stop praying. Maybe we neglect worship. You need to be doing the exact opposite, right? Leaning into God in the face of difficulty and hardship. Leaning into the reality that he is here. If you're a believer here today, as you walk through this life, God is walking with you. He is actively engaged in the various situations in which you find yourself. You know, you need to ele- keep your game elevated because he's close by. Also recognize that in the face of difficulty, you have a high priest that is able to sympathize with you because he has walked through the darkest valley. I was thinking about the 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what I fear no evil for you are with me. And just think about, just think about, the valley that Christ walked through. He walked through the valley of shadow death so you and I can make it through there. He did the darkest valley, right? And because he did that, he sympathizes us, sympathizes with us. He knows our weaknesses. He understands us. And then what? We can draw near with confidence to that nearness. Now, most helpfully for people like me and you, his presence will serve as a restraint from our nonsense and a motivation for our holiness. Now, not only is he at hand, he's coming. And and I think when Paul is saying this, when he's saying the Lord is at hand, he's developing both of these. He isn't just simply saying, well, he's, he's watching you, he's close by. No, he's coming back. And therefore, live in light of the fact that he will return very soon. Um, there's also a very real sense Christ's second coming is being outlined here, and that's to be a motivating factor for you. Here's Luke 12. Jesus says this in verse 35 and 36. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may, be, so they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. I, I've asked myself this. I've asked you this. What do you want to be doing when Christ returns? What do you want him to find you doing? And, and I guess you can think about that for a few moments because all of us are different. And I guess what are the odds, right? What are the odds that he's going to find you doing something that is glorifying to him? Or will the likelihood that he's, you're doing something that maybe doesn't glorify him? Having a fight, thinking hideous thought. I don't know. You, you know yourself. 
You know the temptations you have. But I just want to ask, what are the odds that Christ is going to find you doing something? Now, let me encourage you there. If you're in Christ, even if at the moment of Christ's return, you're stumbling into sin, it's okay. Not, not okay, but Christ has died for your sins, right? And, and even if by hopefully a rare chance that you're engaged in something that doesn't honor him, it's okay if you're in Christ. If you're not, it's not okay. But hopefully, again, for you, for me, we might be doing that which pleases him. Wouldn't it be cool if Christ would return right now for me, preaching? You know, for you, you're worshiping, right? Wouldn't that be fun? You know, Christ returns right now. But, but what happens is if last night, before my wife got home from Italy, I cleaned the bathroom, toilet, all that stuff. What's it going to be like if the Lord returns and I'm doing that? It's not much fun, is it? But it's reality, right? If I can preach for the glory of God, I can scrub the toilet for the glory of God, right? And that's the attitude that we need to be fostering. That's what we need to be doing. And so if the Lord finds me scrubbing the toilet, that he'll be pleased with that scrubbing. Okay? And that's a mentality that all of us need to be developing. So God's nearness to us, his presence, his return, these things lead to joy and gentleness. And lastly, they lead to trusting peacefulness. And then again, we could spend a couple of weeks on six and seven, but, but let's just blow through it real quick. Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Instructions clear, right? Present active imperative verb, uh, do it, do it now, do it all the time. Be anxious for nothing. That is to be a constant, ongoing mentality attitude that you and I are to have. We're to be casting all of our anxieties on him because he cares for you. Whenever I, it's that first Peter five, seven, uh, several of us in here like to fly fish, right? Several of you have done it. I've known and fly fishing is this, you know, kind of delicate. It's kind of a snooty way to fish. Right? You're all, we're all kind of elitists when we do it. Cause we look cool and all that stuff. Right. But you know, this little tiny bug that you're flying that you're throwing out on the water and you're hoping the fish sees it and you boom, come up and get it. Friends, that's not what Peter and Paul are talking about here. It's taking everything. It's like taking the whole bucket of worms and throwing it out into the water. Just everything, every anxiety you have, you throw it all on him. Cast all of your anxieties upon him. Again, a present, active, all the time, sort of thing. Prayer, supplications, requests, all encompassing, everything that concerns you or causes anxiety, money, kids, God's will, husband, wife, job, unbelievers, you name it, God says, bring it to me and give it to me and do it all the time. Do it all the time. One of the things I'm trying to do in my own prayer life is, you know, is really instead of just dealing necessarily with the, the sinful thoughts or, or maybe even the words or the actions that come out because of those sinful thoughts, but, but even trying to even go a, a, a little bit deeper and saying, Lord, what, what is the actual heart motivation that is causing these things? What is it in my flesh that I love? And, and that's the thing is you sit there and you think about some of the thoughts that run through your mind, the wicked sinful, angry, lustful, whatever. What is it about your flesh that loves those? Because that's why you're doing it. There's some sort of wicked pleasure you get about fantasizing about being angry at somebody or something like that. You know what's going on. You're fantasizing about it. You're thinking about it. No one else knows, but you in your mind are just going nuts. And you should repent of that. Lord, these are sinful thoughts. Lord, I, I, I confess this. You've told me that you're faithful. You'll forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Amen. But Lord, why, why are these thoughts even here? What, what, what is it about these things that, that, that tickles some part of my flesh that feels good? And you start to deal even there. Go into the deepest aspects of it. If you're in Christ, that's great because there's no condemnation. Lay it all out there. Lay it all out there. God says to us that as we are doing this, as we're trusting him, thanking him, laying our lives at his feet, his peace, his peace will guard us. Psalm 63, three through five. Because your steadfast love is better than life. Amen? You say that? Your steadfast love is better than life. Is that something that you agree with the psalmist there? Say that? 
my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food in my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Better than life. Why? Well, I, I hope I'm living in light of that truth. It's easy to say, but I hope it's true for me. He talks about you know, rich food and fatness. You know, again, today's uh, pages of my anniversary, and she really likes pasta. And so I, I said, I'll, I'll take her to Pasta Jay's for our anniversary. But then I remembered, or she reminded me she's been in Italy the last two weeks. And I thought, well, so no, so we're gonna go to we're gonna go to three margaritas and have Mexican food instead. But but and I, I, you, my biggest weakness is chips and salsa, and I will be stuffing my face with those things. Uh, but the reality is here is that he's not talking about food. He is, our soul is satisfied. Sit so there, you have a great meal, and just how you feel. You want to take a nap, something like that afterwards. That's the way our soul should be filled with fatness and joy and contentedness and restedness, these types of things. Let that be for you. Be encouraged to ask God to do his perfect work in you. Be encouraged to dig deep. In Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So cast it all on him as you're doing this. Trusting in his goodness, his goodness and his peacefulness, his godness, not worrying so much about the outcome. Again, resting in the character and nature and work of God. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, trusting peacefulness should mark your life. Here's Spurgeon from morning and evening. He's commenting on Psalm 33, 13. He says this, the Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. Perhaps no figure of speech represents God in a more gracious light than when he is spoken of as stooping from his throne and coming down from heaven to attend to the wants and to behold the woes of mankind. We love him who, when Sodom and Gomorrah were full of iniquity, would not destroy those cities until he had made a personal visitation of them. We cannot help pouring out our heart in affection for our Lord who inclines his ear from the highest glory and puts it to the lip of the dying sinner whose failing heart longs after reconciliation. How can we but love him when we know that he numbers the very hairs of our heads, marks our paths, orders our ways? Specifically, is the great truth, is this great truth brought near to our heart when we recollect how attentive he is, not merely to the temporal interests of his creatures, but to their spiritual concerns? Though leagues of distance lie between the finite creature and the infinite creator, Yet there are links uniting both. When a tear is wept by thee, think not that God doeth not behold. For like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Thy sigh is able to move the heart of Jehovah. Thy whisper can incline his ear unto thee. Thy prayer can stay his right hand. Thy faith can move his arm. Think not that God sits on high taking no account of thee. Remember that however poor and needy thou art, yet the Lord thinketh upon thee. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Oh, then repeat the truth that never tires. No God is like the God my soul desires. He at whose voice heaven trembles, even he, great as he is, knows how to stoop to me. Amen. So the question then before us here is this, is your heart perfect towards him? Now again, this is with justification. When God declares us just, when you place your faith in Jesus for forgiveness of sins and eternal life, God takes your sin, puts it on Jesus. He took our sin, placed it on him who knew no sin. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So if you're in Christ today, your heart is judicially perfect. God looks at you as he sees Christ. Perfect, complete. We spend the rest of our lives learning how to live out that judicial perfection. But the question is this. Have you been declared just by God? 
Have you placed your faith in Christ? Are you believing in him for eternal life? Do you recognize he died for you, for your sins, rose again on the third day? And are you believing that? If so, then four proofs of the presence of Christ in your life. There should be growing joy, gentleness, growing awareness of his presence, and trusting peacefulness. Due to God's presence and provision, we should be joyful, gentle, and peaceful people. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, again, thank you.